This video we're going to talk about the revert procedure or the modified Valsalva and specifically how it's interacting with the physiology of the heart to treat SVT. So we know that the revert is typically going to be used when we have a patient who's in supraventricular tachycardia and we're going to use that to try to slow the AV node down to terminate the reentry pathway that's causing the SVT and put the patient back into a normal sinus rhythm. So we'll start off with a very quick review here of what a supraventricular tachycardia is here. So if we look at the strip that we have, we're going to look for a couple of things. One rate is going to be important. So as we look at the rate here, we see that we have a rate of 197 beats per minute. Typically, what we're going to see for an SVT is a rate over 150. So here we have a rate of 197 beats per minute. The other piece that we're going to be aware of is the rhythm. So we want to know if the rhythm is regular or irregular. And here we have a very regular rhythm. If we're going to line up the QRS complexes, what we'll see is that they are equal distance apart across the entirety of this rhythm strip. So our rhythm is regular, which is important. So we have a fast rhythm that has a, a regular occurrence. So it's regular, it's very fast. The next thing we would be looking for is P waves. So if we look at our P waves, what we'll find here is that there are no discernible P waves. So as we go through this rhythm strip, what we're recognizing is that we have our QRS complex, we have a T wave, and then another QRS complex and T wave. So if we look at each of these segments, they are only QRS complex and T wave. There is no P wave present. One thing to be mindful of is if you only see one positive deflection after your QRS complex, that is your T wave. So sometimes people will get mixed up and they'll think that this is the P wave here. Well, that is the first positive deflection following the QRS complex. So that will always be the T wave. Ventricular repolarization is going to always appear more readily than a P wave. So if we only have one positive deflection, then that will pretty much always be your T wave. So here we see T waves, QRS complexes, and no P waves. So the other relevant concept is that we have no P waves present, which means that the PR interval is irrelevant here. And then we want to look at the QRS complexes and make sure they're not wide. So we're differentiating this between something like a VTAC. And we see that they are narrow here. So QRS complexes are narrow. So as we go through through all of those steps and uh, we see that we have a fast rhythm that is regular with narrow QRS complexes. We know it's coming from somewhere above the ventricles, which makes this a supraventricular tachycardia. Now in terms of supraventricular tachycardia, the most common cause of SVT is going to be a reentry pathway within the AV node. So this is our AV node here. And usually what's happening is for these patients, we have a reentry pathway that's occurring uh, within that AV node. But do have a video on AV nodal reentry tachycardia and what's happening there. So we won't go over that too extensively here, but we'll on our AV node just so we have kind of a little bit of an idea of what's happening for these patients and why the revert procedure is going to be so effective. And the important thing to remember that in someone who has an SVT that is going to be the result of an AV nodal uh, reentry tachycardia is that what's happening for these patients is that we have an accessory pathway. So this is the accessory pathway uh, here. And that accessory pathway has been stimulated for whatever reason, but it has been stimulated under the perfect conditions that allow for reentry to occur. And what's happening in reentry is that our electrical conduction is cyclically firing around the accessory pathway and sending rapid impulses down towards the ventricle. So instead of having normal conduction coming from the SA node to the AV node, and then from the AV node down to the ventricles to stimulate conduction, we have a tiny little microscopic uh, accessory pathway and reentry node that's happening here that is causing excessive impulse translation to the ventricles. And again, what's important about this is that it can't happen without the perfect conditions being present. So what I'm going to highlight in green here is that for this to occur and to continue to occur, we must have what's called critical timing or the this reentry pathway must consistently be firing in a way in which we're not hitting refractory period and we're not allowing any impulse to enter from the SA node. So the really important piece to this is that we must have critical timing and that is what's relevant or why that's relevant is when we're looking at something like the revert procedure, what we're trying to do is abolish this critical timing, which should then abolish the reentry pathway. So let's now consider the revert procedure. So when we find someone who is stable, so they're in a stable SVT, so they are not hypotensive, they're not having any significant clinical signs of decompensation with their SVT and we're looking to terminate it, we're going to try the reverb procedure or the modified Valsalva procedure. Now this is an update to the tra uh, traditional Valsalva where someone simply bears down. And there are a few important pieces to this. So when we're doing the modified Valsalva, often we're having the person blow into a syringe. So the syringe is relevant because we're going to, instead of simply having the patient bear down, we're going to have them blow into the syringe. Typically uh, by having them blow into the syringe, we're generating a pressure of around 40 millimeters of mercury, which has been shown to have an increased benefit or increased chance of converting someone out of their SVT. And we're going to have them blow into that syringe for 15 seconds. Again, important to recognize that the patient has to continue to blow in the syringe for those 15 seconds. So it's critical here that we are going to have sustained effort and that effort should be sustained around that 40 uh, millimeters of mercury pressure in order to have the benefit of the strained position or the increase in intrathoracic pressure. So what's happening? Why are we doing this? So we, why are we having someone blow into the syringe for 15 seconds? The reason is that this will create an increase in intrathoracic pressure. And it's this increase in intrathoracic pressure that's going to have a couple of 
of impacts on this patient. One is that as we increase intrathoracic pressure, which we'll draw in blue here, so as we are kind of pushing in on the intrathoracic space, we'll start to push in on the venous structures in that intrathoracic uh, space. And what we're going to do is uh, actually reduce preload. So we see an increase in pressure pushing in on the venous structures within the intrathoracic space. And what that will do is reduce the amount of blood uh, returning to the heart. So we actually see a reduction in preload. And why that's relevant is if we have a reduction in preload, it means that we have a decreased amount of blood returning to the heart. So we have a reduction in preload, reduced blood returning to the heart, which ultimately will lead to a reduction in cardiac output. So we see increased pressure on the venous structures, which is going to reduce preload or reduce the amount of blood returning to the heart. And as a result, we're going to reduce cardiac output. And what happens when we have a reduction in cardiac output is we're going to activate baroreceptors. So what happens is that reduction in cardiac output will be recognized by uh, baroreceptors within the aortic arch, and we're going to stimulate compensatory mechanisms. And one of the compensatory mechanisms that you see activated is the activation of the nucleus tractus solitaris in the brain, which will stimulate things like a sympathetic nervous system response. So that reduction in cardiac output is going to activate baroreceptors. It'll activate baroreceptors, which will signal the nucleus tractus solitarius to increase sympathetic nervous system tone. So we see an increase in our sympathetic nervous system tone, and that will increase our systemic vascular resistance. So we see an increase in systemic vascular resistance, which will do a couple things. One, that means that we're going to increase pressure peripherally to try and increase the amount of blood that we see returning to the heart. So part of the sympathetic nervous system response here is going to be increase that sympathetic nervous system tone, increase systemic vascular resistance, and try to push more blood back to the heart. And that's exactly, exactly what we're going to see here is that sympathetic nervous system response will increase preload, and we're actually going to start to increase the amount of filling that we see within this ventricle. So the whole goal here is to Im uh, impact the sympathetic nervous system and result in an increase in preload. So we typically see that, especially if we have that uh, increase in intrathoracic pressure to 40 millimeters of mercury for about 15 seconds. So that increase in systemic vascular resistance increases preload. And that is what exactly what we're looking for here with the modified Valsalva is to increase that preload to see if we can uh, generate a, a cycle of events that will eventually lead to increased parasympathetic nervous system tone. So what you might be thinking here is, well, how does that actually lead to an increase in parasympathetic nervous system tone? So far, we've just been blowing into a syringe for 15 seconds, uh, generating that 40 millimeters of mercury pressure, um, which is going to increase intrathoracic pressure and reduce preload, which activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is probably what we don't want to do when we have a heart rate of 190 beats per minute. And this sets us up for what's going to happen when we release that pressure. So remember, by activating the sympathetic nervous system, we've actually created an increase in preload. So now we have more blood returning to the heart. And after that 15 seconds, what we have the patient do is relieve pressure. So the next step here is to relieve the pressure or release the pressure by stopping uh, blowing in the syringe. So the patient will stop blowing in the syringe, they'll release the pressure. And what will happen is that we'll no longer have this intrathoracic pressure. So we stop the intrathoracic pressure while we still have this increase in preload. We have a uh, reduction in intrathoracic pressure, but we still have increased preload from the sympathetic nervous system tone. And what will happen here is we'll start to activate some of our receptors that are going to lead to a, a parasympathetic nervous system response. So as our intrathoracic pressure starts to normalize and we have this increase in preload, this will start to be recognized by a couple of different areas. One is we're going to have that recognition by our atrial st stretch receptors. That increase in preload will be recognized by our atrial stretch receptors. So we have receptors in the atria that are going to recognize when we have an increase in preload as well as recognition by our ventricular mechanoreceptors. So basically receptors within the ventricle that are going to respond to how much pressure they are beating against. So as we release that intrathoracic pressure, we see that increase in preload still entering the heart. And that is going to be recognized by our atrial receptors or ventricular receptors that are going to respond to pressures. And the impact of this is that as we see an increased preload or we see increased stretch associated with these receptors, they will signal a vagal response. So the whole goal here is to increase intrathoracic pressure as we blow into the syringe or 40 millimeters of mercury for 15 seconds and trigger the sympathetic nervous system to increase systemic vascular resistance and increase preload. We're trying to force more blood back to the heart. When we release that pressure or suddenly stop blowing into the syringe, all that's left is that increase in preload, which the heart is going to recognize through these atrial stretch receptors and our ventricular mechanoreceptors. And it's now going to think, well, we have too much stretch or too much preload and we need to activate the vagus nerve. So this activation of the stretch and the mechanoreceptors is going to lead to a vagal response. Where essentially, the body is going to activate the parasympathetic nervous system in order to try to reduce some of this preload because it's recognizing a lot of stretch. Now, if we draw in our vagus nerve in light green here, what we know about this vagus nerve is that it's probably primarily going to act on the SA node and the AV node. So when we get this vagal response, what we actually start to see is uh, recognition that we have too much preload uh, in the ventricle or the atria, but stretch receptors and mechanoreceptors. We see signals being sent to the medulla and the brain, which are going to then activate the vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve will activate or will act on the SA node and the AV node. And what we typically see is um, 
Acetylcholine bonding to our M2 receptors. Within the SA node and the AB nodes, we see M2 receptor activation, which leads to potassium channel opening. We start to see opening of potassium channels, which will eventually or will typically lead to a reduction in heart rate. Now you might be thinking, well, that looks like the normal Valsalva maneuver. So we have the person bear down, and then we have the response of the parasympathetic nervous system, and hopefully we stop the SVT from happening. And what is different here is that we're pairing this increase in intrathoracic pressure for 15 seconds by with sudden cessation, which will lead to this vagal response that we looked at here. We're pairing that with an increase in preload by a positional change in this patient. And that is what is unique here to our modified Valsalva, the revert procedure, is that after we have finished this 15 seconds of intrathoracic pressure by blowing into the syringe, we immediately lift uh, the patient's legs and lie them back. So we uh, lift the legs and lie them back and we do this for additional 15 seconds. And the benefit to this is all about preload. So what we're trying to do here is further increase preload. So what happens is blood will move from the periphery or for the legs as we elevate them up into the intrathoracic space. And what we see is a large increase in preload, which will maximize our vagal tone. And we do that by further stimulating the stretch and mechanoreceptors. So here we get an increase in preload because we have increased sympathetic nervous system response. And then we pull back on our intrathoracic pressure, which allows for more blood to enter into the ventricle. And that gives us an increase in stretch or preload. And then by immediately lying the person back and allowing for blood to uh, move from the periphery or the legs up into the uh, heart, we maximize that preload. So instead of having um, a little bit of an increase in preload, we start to maximize that preload. So we start to basically make this response happen at an elevated rate with this modified Valsalva. And we're really maximizing that preload or maximizing the amount of blood that is stretching the walls of our ventricle and our atria. And that is why we typically will see a much better response with a modified Valsalva or the revert procedure compared to normal Valsalva. But a 43% conversion rate compared to about a 17% conversion rate with normal Valsalva. So the big difference here why that raising those legs are so important is this massive increase in preload, which is simply going to have the same effect that we're looking for here. So that increase in preload is going to activate those stretch and mechanoreceptors, uh, just like we see following release of that intrathoracic pressure from blowing into the syringe. So really important that we're pairing these two things together. And how this leads to a termination of our reentry pathway is that we'll basically wipe out this critical timing. So when we activate the vagal response, acetylcholine binds to our M2 receptors and we open our potassium channels in the SA and AV node, we hyperpolarize the membrane or we slow down the membrane potential, which makes longer refractory periods will make this impulse travel slower and it typically can then no longer meet this critical timing. So by activating the, or opening those potassium channels and leading to hyperpolarization of our membrane, what we do is we increase more chances for termination of this rhythm. So we're simply creating more chance that this reentry pathway within the AV node can no longer meet its critical timing or can no longer cycle with without meeting a refractory period, we wipe out this critical timing, and then hopefully we wipe out the SVT. So to recap, what we're doing here is we're trying to activate vagal tone in order to target a reentry pathway that lives in the AV node. In order to do that, we start with having the patient increase intrathoracic pressure by blowing into a syringe for, to create 40 millimeters mercury pressure for 15 seconds. By doing that, we increase intrathoracic pressure, which will reduce preload for our ventricle. That reduction in preload is recognized by the atria in the ventricle, and we activate the sympathetic nervous system through the nucleus tractus solitarius in order to increase systemic vascular resistance, which will promote an increase in preload. After that 15 seconds is over, when we release that intrathoracic pressure suddenly, all of a sudden we have this increase in preload or we have more blood returning without that restricted uh, intrathoracic pressure that we saw before. We have an increase in preload, which will be recognized by atrial stretch receptors and ventricular mechanoreceptors. That will trigger a vagal response. So those receptors will send a signal up to the medulla or up to the brain to say that there is too much stretch in the ventricle, which will activate the vagus nerve and we will see opening of potassium channels and hyperpolarization. What we do is we pair that sudden reduction in intrathoracic pressure when the person stops blowing into the syringe with a repositioning of the patient. So we lift their leg and we put them into the supine position with the legs lifted in order to promote even more return of blood to the heart. So not only do we see an increase in preload for these patients because we've reduced intrathoracic pressure while increasing sympathetic nervous system tone, when we lie them back, we physically promote much more blood returning to those ventricles. So what we start to see is way more stretch and we get even more activation of our atrial stretch receptors and our ventricular mechanoreceptors. So as a result, we get an elevated or enhanced vagal response. So we send even more signals to the brain saying, hey, that's not enough vagal response. We get even more vagal tone, even more acetylcholine binding to M2 receptors, even more opening of potassium channels, and a, a greater response in terms of hyperpolarization. And the benefit here is that hyperpolarization will reduce the critical timing that we need to have a reentry pathway. So we're basically going to shut down this reentry by increasing our refractory period, blowing rate, and making it much or much harder for this reentry to have that perfect time necessary to create this cyclic process in the AV node. And what that will do is if this gets knocked out, it gives the SA node time to take over and we should see that patient enter back into a sinus rhythm.